Anna Halpine presents on Building a Civilization of Love at the 2019 Newman Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Father Mattia. And a welcome to this, our third uh, Reborn in Wonder lecture, the third one of the, of the, of the series. Um, in one of his calmer moments, Shakespeare's Hamlet, and he doesn't have too many calm moments. He's sometimes browbeating his mother or harpooning Polonius behind the curtain. But in one of his calmer moments, he reflects on the question of what it means to be human. What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. And through his famous protagonist, Shakespeare is restating for his own time, early 17th century England, the timeless message found in the book of Psalms. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou dost care for him? Thou hast made him little less than God, and dost crown him with glory and honor. Both the psalmist and Shakespeare are keenly interested in that most fundamental of questions. What is man? What is mankind? What does it mean to be human? And this is the question that underlies all that we do here at the Newman Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture, and indeed at the Newman Center. Our undergraduate classes in the great books, our evening seminars in philosophy and literature, these Reborn in Wonder uh, lectures, they're all intended to help us grapple with life's most pressing questions. The unexamined life we know is simply not worth living, so Socrates tells us. And so we continue to wrestle with the question of questions, what is man? And with those questions that follow naturally upon it, how should we live? What is our purpose? What and whom should we love? Our speaker tonight, Anna Halpine, has dedicated her life to helping young people around the world, and not just young people, deal with these and other fundamental questions. Her life work began in a firestorm of controversy at a 1999 UN conference on population and development. The conference featured 32 speakers, young people, who claimed to represent the world's 3 billion young people. Now, just the, the, the ratio the, of representation is obviously absurd, 32 people speaking for uh, 3 billion, but that's what they claimed. And in an example of group speak worthy of George Orwell, they boldly announced to UN delegates that young people, the world over, universally demanded abortion as a human right. They demanded absolute sexual freedom and a restriction of parental authority that would presumably limit or seek to deny that freedom. Well, Anna, who is a, a lot less mild-mannered than she first appears, as you, will, as you will see, thought to herself with growing um, uh, annoyance, if not anger, that's not what all young people want. So against UN protocol, she distributed to delegates a flyer that countered the specious claims made by the UN's carefully vetted representatives. Her message defended life and objected to the agenda of sexual and so-called reproductive rights. As Anna tells the story, what resulted from this distribution of this now notorious uh, pink flyer was absolute pandem pandemonium, you know, with delegates dividing as cleanly as the waters of the Red Sea. Uh, on one side, the Clinton-led, administration-led ideologues of, of the West. On the other, delegates from developing countries outraged by the new face of colonialism. And many of these latter thanked Anna afterwards for being a lone voice crying in the wilderness of modernity. And so the World Youth Alliance was born with Anna as its first president. Since then, it has sought to help people understand the meaning of human dignity, to answer those questions having to do with identity and destiny. It has done this through 
international law initiatives, through human rights uh, ventures. It fosters economic growth uh, and global health, working with young people from around the world and with government leaders in order to propose solutions that are consistent with human dignity. Most recently, or more recently, Anna founded and is the CEO of FEM, that is Fertility Education and Medical Management, for women to learn more about themselves and their bodies and to be more educated consumers in a climate where medical practitioners routinely counsel contraception, abortion, and sterilization. Anna is, uh, grew up as a, a Catholic in Canada. She has the scars to prove it. Um, difficult situation there. She has a bachelor's in music from Mount Allison University in Canada. And she also earned a master's in philosophy and religion from Yale University. She now lives in New York City, where both FEM and the World Youth Alliance have their headquarters. Reflecting on her important work, I'm reminded of what Pope St. John Paul told young people in preparation for a visit to Denver some 25 years ago. It was the eighth World Youth Day. Some of you were not born, but some of us, some of us were there. I remember that, that uh, wonderful event. John Paul said, true and lasting unity cannot be created by coercion and violence. It can only be created by building on the foundation of a common heritage of values, accepted and shared by all. Values such as respect for the dignity of the human person, a willingness to welcome life, the defense of human rights, and openness to transcendence and the realm of the spirit. John Paul's dream, possible only as all good things are, through the grace of God, was to build a civilization of love over and against what he called the culture of death. So we honor that vision tonight, praying God's grace upon us and upon those like Anna Halpine, who work for that end. Her talk, Building the Civilization of Love, the Work of the World Youth Alliance. Please give a warm welcome to Anna Halpine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Free. I'm, I'm actually tempted to just reconvene to cocktails after that <laughs> wonderful introduction. Um, but in all seriousness, it's a great pleasure to be here. Lincoln is a wonderful place to be, and it's, it always feels a little bit like uh, you've let in a refugee from, from Mordor who's uh, allowed to have a couple of days here in the Shire. As Dr. Free uh, mentioned, uh, Gotham really does house Mordor, and that's really where the World Youth Alliance began. So 20 years ago this year, uh, when some of you were not yet born, um, I'm young and was younger then, uh, I went into the UN as a young music student, and as Dr. Free said, the World Youth Alliance was founded in a flurry of pink flyers and pandemonium. The Clinton delegation was really organizing this representation of, of youth. 32 young people were brought in from around the world. Most of them were from developing nations. And by happenstance, uh, this white Canadian girl stood up and started to offer an alternative option to all of the developing nations. So paradox was alive and well, and we began to move forward. The questions that we faced were really to say, what is the driving idea at the heart of all of these ideas that are being discussed here at the UN today? We were looking not just at abortion as a human right, sexual rights for children, and a deletion of parents' rights. We were looking, as the head of UNICEF said during those days, at a galaxy of human rights new human rights, totally undefined, all of them moving and pushing this new idea and this new agenda. So after the World Youth Alliance was founded in this moment to say there is a different way, there has to be a better way for human flourishing and respect for the dignity of the human person, we had to try to understand what is this rooted in. If we have this galaxy of human rights, 
what is the heart and the soul of what we are facing? And we kept trying to worry this question, try to get to the heart and a core of what was actually being debated in the midst of all of these ideas. And in the meantime, we went back to the UN in 2000, which was Beijing plus five. So Cairo plus five in 99 was population and development. Beijing was the great conference on women. Uh, it's worth noting that the idea of abortion as a human right came out of Cairo, and the new idea, the new term of gender, came out of Beijing. So in Beijing, at, at Beijing plus five in 2000, we were really in, as some of you might remember from ancient history you're now studying, the final year of that Clinton second term. And what we were facing was, again, the same question of an attempt to create an international human right to abortion through the United Nations, as well as broaden all of these new types of undefined human rights. And here it was at Beijing plus five at three o'clock in the morning, which is when all the serious negotiation happens at the UN. The, the small delegations are exhausted, but delegations like Canada and the US and the EU, which have 50 to 250 people on them, can begin to negotiate around the clock in order to try to move the most contentious and the most difficult paragraphs to the most difficult times. And so at three o'clock in the morning, well past the weeks when these negotiations were supposed to be over, the United States presented a very short oral amendment which simply said, human rights grant human dignity. Human rights grant human dignity. And so as Dr. Free pointed out, even as Hamlet and others in moments have moments of clarity, these delegates of the UN had a moment of great clarity and they voted this amendment down. They did this, of course, because this amendment was the reversal of the entire modern human rights project. And it completely upended the whole project of the UN following the atrocities of World War II, which was to recognize that the entire purpose of the modern human rights project was to respect and defend the dignity of the human person as the, as the litmus test for the, for the realization and the reality of those human rights. And so what we started to see, let's see if we can, <laughs> I'm gonna need help from Father again, I think. Uh, what we saw was this movement to really understand this political function of these human rights and to move them uh, towards power. So human rights, as we saw in these early years, were really not about the human person. They were about who controlled power and who was able to move things along. We waited too long. Thank you. So at three o'clock in the morning, what we were able to see was really this question of what was actually going on displayed fully in front of us. We were not just talking about specific issues like abortion or sexual rights. We were talking about the fundamental idea of the human person. Is the human person an object which can be used or manipulated or destroyed at will by the state, by those in power? Or is the human person a being with inviolable dignity, which is the basis and the evaluation of the judgment of states? This is really what this amendment meant. It was an attempt by the Clinton administration to reverse human rights and say those who have power have the ability to decide who has human dignity, who is a person, and who is not. And so that very early morning at the UN, we saw that fundamentally at the heart of this galaxy of human rights, fundamentally at these debates about the human person, was this question of the human person. And this caused us to try to say, how can we understand who the human person is? What kind of flesh and bones can we put on this idea? And this led us in many ways to all of the topics that World Youth Alliance members now study to try to recognize all the knowledge that we do have in answering that question. And at the heart of that answer was what we found was in particular one man, John Paul II, who had his finger on the pulse of the question of our time and whose life work was really giving us both a philosophy and a theology to answer 
that question. But all of this is really related to the question that takes place at the UN continuously, year after year, day after day, and continues to be debated there today. And I can say that our staff are flying this evening to Nairobi, where Cairo plus 25 begins this coming week. And these ideas are alive and well, and we continue to have all of these same debates in more and more pressurized and funded forms day after day. What I'd like to do in the interest of time is give you a very short overview, not of the philosophical ideas of the World Youth Alliance, because I think this crowd is actually quite well versed in many of them, but to introduce to you how these ideas get used and manipulated through global policy and how that then led us to develop our answers to this, which are the Human Dignity Curriculum and FEM. So what I want to show you now are some of the key documents at the UN that we work on that have helped us to understand how these ideas are moving forward and still being worked out today. This is a document from an organization you may not have heard about called the Center for Reproductive Rights. It is one of the most powerful NGOs in the world, also based in New York City, better funded and more influential than us. But what I want you to take a look at, you can read this as I speak, and what you might find is it's very complicated. It's not so easy to understand what was said when you get to the end of the sentence. But I've highlighted some of the key points. Because what this document by CRR is saying is that multiple human rights instruments, these are treaties and negotiated documents that states commit themselves to achieve and uphold, protect the right to life. And then they list many of these treaties that governments have signed. And at the conclusion of this long section of analysis that CRR provides, they state this, forcing a woman to undergo a life-threatening unsafe abortion threatens her right to life. What does this mean? What this means is that according to CRR, if a woman is forced to have an abortion, let's say because abortion is, uh, she, she cannot have an abortion because abortion is illegal, then her right to life has been threatened. This is a complete twist and change of the human rights treaty that these countries have signed. Because CRR is saying that unless a woman always has access to abortion, her right to life is being threatened. We might say we don't care what CRR thinks, but we should care what CRR thinks because what I want to show you next is what happens with this language and how it affects international and global treaties and the specific evaluation of various countries. CRR is one of the most important organizations in interpreting and giving their own slant to ideas that happen at the UN, but one of the things that they also do is they provide shadow reports on government submissions to UN treaty monitoring bodies. And in this way, CRR impacts how the UN responds to countries when they submit their reports to the UN and when they receive their feedback. So this is language from an official UN document which is talking about a committee review of Kenya and Kenya has submitted its government evaluation of how they are fulfilling this treaty, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, in their review in 2008. This is an important moment because, uh, in parentheses, right after this, in 2009, Kenya had a constitutional debate which included a change of its law on abortion. But in 2008, and I'll come back to what happened there. In 2008, they submitted their review of how they were doing on this treaty to the UN. And the committee that responded to Kenya's report said this, that they're concerned about the limited access to sexual and reproductive health services and contraceptives, as well as these clandestine abortions in the state party, that's Kenya. The committee further went on, having raised its concerns to now recommending what should be done. The committee recommended, this is a formal UN treaty monitoring body, reading these reports, they recommended that the state party, that's Kenya, 
provide affordable, including for adolescents, comprehensive family planning services, including contraceptive and safe abortion services, especially for the poor in rural areas, and the free distribution of contraception in all of these situations. So the important thing is that what we're doing is we're evaluating Kenya's compliance with Article 12 of the treaty that Kenya has signed. And so what we have to ask ourselves now is what does Article 12 say? Would anybody like to guess what Article 12 says? <laughs> Here is Article 12 of the actual treaty that Kenya signed. Many people will guess that Article 12 is a paragraph about health or sexual and reproductive health. But Paragraph 12 is hardly about any of these things at all. The Kenyan government has committed to the reduction of the stillbirth and infant mortality rate, the improvement of environmental and industrial hygiene, the prevention and treatment of epidemic and other diseases, and creating conditions that enhance medical service provision. Based on this article, the Kenyan government has received that committee report clarifying that they must provide and pay for contraception, uh, sexual education, and abortion, especially to the poor. So I show this because this is actually what's happening at the UN day after day. This is actually how these debates unfold, how these three o'clock in the morning debates about the human person, how the CRR and all of these other NGOs start to influence what happens in these countries. And all of this happens, what, ha what all of this influences what actually happens on the ground. And here we can take a look at the example of 2009 to 2010. Kenya had their constitutional debate. And in this debate was a provision to legalize abortion, which parenthetically was not in the actual text <laughs> that the Kenyan government agreed upon, but was inserted after the parliamentary agreement by the UN facilitating body. So the Kenyan people were now voting on a constitution that included the legalization of abortion, which had been inserted by a UN agency. And in the midst of this, someone, even the young students might have heard of, Joe Biden was the vice president at the time, flew to Kenya and said in the media, if you vote yes for this constitutional change, quote, the money will flow. At the same time, a new bill was rolled out in the Philippines called the Reproductive Health Bill. And here, we'll see what happened with that bill. But this was funded, uh, let's say funded or encouraged by a grant of funding from the same US government State Department and our Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton, gave 500 million to the Philippines government for them to pass this RH bill. So what we started to see at the UN, year after year, time after time, was that we're having this debate about the human person, but this debate about the human person was not just a debating society. How we answered this question of who is the human person turned immediately into concrete programs, mostly contraception and sexual education, which were then pushed by international aid agencies to change laws and cultural policies on the ground. And so we came to understand that what we're really looking at with policy is not a debate, but a wheel. Policy, if it has teeth, drives funding, and funding is for program implementation. And those who implement programs or have the capacity to do so ultimately have greater influence on the shaping of those policy debates and how this wheel continues to unfold. And we can say that this is the same domestically and internationally, and that some of the people who are the most excellent at this would be Planned Parenthood and its international, International Planned Parenthood Federation. So as we went through all of these years and experiences, we had the experience that we could make winnable arguments in winsome ways. We could actually win on text that would be adopted inside the UN, but we were still losing. We were losing in Kenya because they were pushing these programs through the funding wheel. We were losing in the Philippines even when nobody wanted these bills because we couldn't write an alternate bill that would put new types of programs in play. We saw that these programs would have to meet international commitments that governments had made, but we thought there must be a way to do this 
while still respecting our vision of the human person. And that was what led us to understand that just as sex ed and gender programs, which we can think of as the marketing for a vision of the human person, along with contraception as the only way these programs understand women's health, just as these push the adoption of abortion and population control, could we populate such types of programs, education for children and women's health programs that would actually respond and respect to our vision of the human person and start to offer a new way forward. And this is what led us to build the human dignity curriculum where we recognized in a certain sense that gender education is fundamentally a secular anthropology. And we also have another anthropology, a human anthropology that we can and uh, potentially was a big challenge, start to roll out and teach our children as well. And with them, we saw we could build a model for women's health that would actually provide health care to women and in this way start to see if we could rearrange and re-engage this policy wheel. I want to now walk briefly through both of these programs, uh, but here is an example of why we felt a new approach to sexual education was needed. Many of you will be already familiar with this, but this is the definition of sexuality from the World Health Organization. And that has meaning because these definitions drive the types of programs that the World Health Organization funds and brings to countries. So I'll leave you to read that yourself. But what we need to understand here is these are not just ideas. These are ideas that are meant to be put into practice and put into curricular content for children. A lot of times when we think about these UN ideas, we think about the challenge we're facing in the UN pushing these ideas into Africa. But I want to also clarify, this is the WHO, the World Health Organization curriculum guidelines for Europe. And this content and this curriculum is in schools in every country in Europe today. And this is the same content that is now in the gender and sexual education curricula that we have in our country as well. Ages zero to four are expected to understand these concepts and master skills related to them in their lives. And of course, this goes uh, up through all of the ages, uh, which I won't show. But this is the same kind of content that's already in our public schools here. And so these ideas are not just for other people. They're not just an export that we are bringing around the world. They're also directly these ideas that we are bringing into our own schools and in our own communities. However, there is no type of sex ed that's mandated in international human rights law. And so we saw that while there is the requirement in many places, as well as in the United States, to provide gender or sexual education, the content in that education is not mandated, and so there's room. There's room for us to imagine a kind of human anthropology-based content that could take our vision of the human person and bring this directly to our children. And this was the attempt we made in building the Human Dignity Curriculum. It's the first curriculum program that takes this idea of human anthropology and tries to now sequence and build this starting at age four, kindergarten, and up through all of the grades, providing children with a clear anthropology and an attempt to understand and answer this question, who am I? The themes, which circle back and expand year after year, are the following. We start with a definition of human dignity, but very quickly we saw in the testing in the schools that the smartest children would ask this question to understand, are we, and if so, what is the difference between humans and animals? And teachers were not able to answer this question. The children were seeing, they were seeing documentaries that would say dolphins have a language, or they would learn that, you know, they, they have the experience, in fact, that their dog loves them seemingly better than their friends and, and others. And so all of these questions were very challenging to meet, and we realized we had to take the curriculum apart and address this right up front. And therefore, what we begin with, even in kindergarten, is this hierarchy of living beings. And so the children learn to start categorize, categorizing all that they see around them so that they can start to differentiate between what it is that humans and animals and plants share, 
and what it is that is different. And of course, as many of you know, there's only a very small difference between humans and animals, which is the entire difference of moral responsibility and capacity, which is our ability to think and choose. And this sets up the discussion of human freedom and the capacity for the pursuit of human excellence. And in our evaluations, which have now ranged from street children in Mexico, the slums of Manila, and the wealthiest children in Manhattan, the evaluations come back in a very consistent way, which is that the children are all giving us the same type of feedback. The idea that they can think and choose, they say, is like learning to fly. And that's, of course, quite true. They have this complete expansion of their heart, knowing that they have this power and understanding very concretely how they can begin to use it. And all of this has started to move forward in very clear and concrete ways and opens up for them a very clear language they can use to explain who they are and it starts to dictate the kind of choices and the kind of commitments they want to make in their lives. Moving over to the question of women's health, again we saw that looking at the international requirements for reproductive health and for women's health, they are quite broad and they do not preclude a different way. They do not dictate, in fact, that the only kind of women's health care that could be provided is abortion and contraception. Quite the opposite, they invite a kind of consideration for health care that responds to the reality and dignity of women. And yet, we can see that all of the international funding and program implementation is for programs that are focused in this very narrow way of reducing women's health merely to contraception and abortion. So FAM was developed to answer this new question, to say, is there a better way to provide health care to women? And what we found was that, in fact, women's health, as everyone knows, <laughs> is dominated by hormones, but this hormonal activity begins from the brain. And so what you can see here is you can see that in a very simplified way, there's a hormonal dance that happens. It begins from the brain. It speaks to the ovary. And so the brain recruits this follicle, and the ovary then produces estrogen. If estrogen rises on a slope, it sends a signal for the second brain hormone, LH. LH is the sort of TNT, the dynamite hormone. And its job is to cause that follicle to explode. That's ovulation, and now it's the empty follicle that produces progesterone. So the ovary produces estrogen and progesterone, and the brain is the signal that changes those directions. And we might ask, why does this matter if I'm not trying to get pregnant? And the answer is that the right amount of estrogen and progesterone at the right time in a woman's body affects every single organ and system of her health. And this is particularly true in adolescence when the hormonal axis is coming into play. And we can see that the right amounts of estrogen and progesterone are critical for the development of a woman's brain, for her bone health, for her blood sugar levels, and for her well-being, for her sleep, anxiety, and energy levels. And remember, if a woman is not ovulating, she is not producing progesterone. And see how important that is to every system of her body. There are many reasons a woman might not ovulate, and there are many symptoms that happen when that's the case. And all of these symptoms are well known to us, and. One third of women in the United States and almost two thirds of adolescent women are prescribed the pill to manage these symptoms. So the symptoms are caused by hormones that are not acting at the right level. And the pill is provided to these women as a sort of high dose hormone blanket that puts all of the rest of her hormones and symptoms to sleep. The main thing we have to remember, however, is that we're not correcting these hormonal activities. We're not getting that nice flow of hormonal interaction. And also, this hormone blanket is a very high level, constant dose of hormones, higher than anything her body will ever produce, which is the reason why it suppresses both ovulation and these symptoms. So 
The FEM app is the tool that we provide to women so that they can start to understand and learn their own body. They can record their biomarkers. They get personalized feedback about what's happening in their own body and help to identify if something is not acting the way it should be. And this can help to trigger the woman to say it's time to talk to a health coach or it's time to talk to a doctor to start to get some better help to restore that hormonal function. And this is really the purpose and point of FEM, is that instead of suppressing these hormonal symptoms, we want to try to work with the woman to restore her health. Instead of suppressing those symptoms with a higher dose level of hormones, we want to try to work with her to diagnose and treat that underlying hormonal condition to get her the care she deserves. So I want to walk you very quickly through the medical training and the medical approach that's happening now to collaborate with her in diagnosing and treating this underlying condition. Physiologically speaking, we know that a woman's cycle should be about 24 to 36 days long. There's a clear ovulatory pattern, and she has 9 to 18 days of progesterone. When that is not happening, or when she experiences pain or too many other symptoms, what we now know is that we need to run a full and complete hormonal profile. We looked at the interaction of the four major reproductive hormones, but women's health is so complex because those four hormones happen at the right level at the right time when 12 hormones are functioning as they should. And remember, if you look at those hormonal changes, these fluctuations are changing every day, sometimes minutes to hours, in very real and important ways. And this explains why women's health has been a mystery for so long. And it also explains why the key to this mystery is the brain and hormones and the area of study called reproductive endocrinology, which has certainly been, uh, for many people, the devil's own science, because we can remember that, of course, reproductive endocrinology first gave us the pill, and then it seemed to give us IVF. But what is important to understand is that if we actually go deeper and further into the science, it's reproductive endocrinology that gives us now the solution. And so now we're able to do more. We can not only suppress these symptoms, we can not only suppress women's bodies, we can actually begin to diagnose and treat. And so very briefly, this is how it works. A doctor will take that blood hormone panel, and if they see that FSH, that first hormone from the brain, is over seven, they begin to run through all these additional tests. At the bottom, they have footnotes reminding them of other reasons why that hormone might be elevated. Once they have that data, they also look at the imaging, taking a picture of the ovary and the endometrium. And again, we want the blood level testing, the ovary and the endometrium, and the women's own data to tell us the same story. And here you have on the right, that big black cyst is an example of an, uh, an, an ovary that's about to ovulate. And over here, you can hardly see it. The endometrial lining is telling us that same story. And these data points then come together to give us a new way forward in treating women's health. So a woman who's currently being prescribed contraception to manage her acne can now instead have her hormones tested. We need to look at all these different hormones so that we can see what is that underlying cause and diagnose and treat that. How this comes together is you can see that on the right-hand side, we have examples of charts where the women are tracking their own biomarkers. The top three are gray with a little bit of bleeding. So these show us that these are basically uh, cycles that are not ovulatory and everyone already knows now this is not what we want to see. These are dry cycles with a little bit of bleeding. As you move to the left, the woman will often go to her doctor, get four hormones treated, and here we can see the testing comes back and they show all these hormones are low. But the woman who charted that cycle already knows that. She knows that because she's not seeing that ovulatory pattern, and she knows her hormones are low because she's not ovulating. And at this point, the standard of care in the United States is to suggest to this woman the pill. They'll say, let's put you on the pill because we want to avoid cervical cancer. We don't want you bleeding in irregular ways all the time. And of course, that's true. Nobody wants to have this irregular bleeding and nobody wants cervical cancer. 
But the good news is we can now do more. We can keep going in this diagnosis and get to that primary hormonal disturbance that's causing the cascade of low hormones. And when we get to that primary disturbance, we find three totally different hormones causing those cascades. In the first case, we have a thyroid imbalance. In the second case, we have anorexia. And in the third case, we have an autoimmune disorder. And it's clear that what we're now able to do is have a powerful diagnostic tool that gets us to the root of the cause so that we can diagnose and treat women instead of just providing hormones to cover and mask their symptoms. So all of this gave us a way forward, a way to say that by focusing on the human person, by pursuing the research, by finding a way forward, we could actually develop alternatives to all of the programs that are driving this cultural and this policy change. Instead of gender, we can provide human anthropology and give a curriculum to children to help them understand who they are deepening a personal identity that's rooted in reality and that starts to develop and grow with them as they grow in age. Instead of sexual education, we can provide them with teen femme and teen men, helping them to understand their brain as a control center, which is both driving their physical but also emotional changes, and reminding them with their anthropology that they do not have to be driven by these emotional or physical changes, remember they can think and choose how they respond to all of these signals happening in their body. With FEM, we have a powerful way to provide actual women's health care. Instead of just quieting women's bodies with high doses of hormones and moving away from what we now know to be the gold standard of care, which is diagnosis and treatment that we can provide to women in every part of the world. And our Reproductive Health Research Institute is our partner which is pursuing the research, publishing this information, and training doctors in these new protocols that introduce the latest in reproductive endocrinology to them. So this is the program that FEM has developed, the Human Dignity has developed in collaboration with World Youth Alliance. We expected and thought that if we could stick to this understanding of the human person and push it far enough, we could find new pathways in philosophy, new pathways in science that would take us to a deeper understanding of the human person, allow us to build out programs that respect and embody that, and give us a new way forward so that we can begin to move that policy wheel in a completely different direction. And I'll end just by commenting that as you might remember, much of what we are developing here came out of these direct policy fights that we were engaging in in Kenya and the Philippines as these ideas from the United Nations cascaded into these countries and moved the programs and policies that they were uh, embodying in a totally different way. In the Philippines in particular, we saw that as the RH bill moved into place, it had neither the support of the elites nor the most progressive people in the country. Nobody wanted or advocated for this bill, which was a combination of China's one-child policy and Hillary Clinton's Freedom of Choice Act. That meant that it was more or less the French Revolution and the sexual revolution in one bill for the Philippines, the most radical piece of legislation in the world, and there was no support for it. Nevertheless, we knew from the first day it moved out of committee and onto the floor for debate that we would lose. How can we lose a country that doesn't want to be lost? How can we lose a country that doesn't want any of these elements? And the answer is twofold. We can lose a country because they're under financial pressures to move in a different way. That was true. The US was pushing them half a billion dollars to adopt this bill. But we can also lose a country because we haven't done the work. And that was the main reason why we lost this fight in the Philippines. We did not have the alternative programs we needed so that we could write an alternative bill. The bill in the Philippines was not a debate about abortion. The bill in the Philippines was an implementation bill for gender, sexual education, and reproductive health that had to obliterate rights of conscience for individuals and institutions because the only way to implement 
these education and health care requirements across the country was by co-opting the Catholic schools and hospitals that were there to provide and transmit this information. And because we did not have an alternative program that could be scaled throughout that country, we could not write an alternative bill. That bill is still being held up in legislation at the Supreme Court of the Philippines, even though we lost December 23rd, 2013, by 11 votes. But meanwhile, we moved quickly to start building what we knew we needed, which was the Human Dignity Curriculum and FEM, so that we could be ready for next time. And I'm happy to report that next time has also arrived in the Philippines, which is now the first country in the world which is drafting with us a new values-based education bill, which is hoping to find a way to roll out a national bill that will bring the human dignity curriculum to the schools in the Philippines. So we're starting to see that this policy wheel works. We're starting to see that with this very beginning approach, a new response that embodies the human person in this tangible way, we can begin to move forward very concretely, very quickly, helping our allies and helping those who are ready to fight in these areas to have the tools they need, as Churchill said, to win the war. So thank you very much for your attention this evening. And if there's time or interest, I'm happy to answer any questions.